So this is a beautiful all white custom non-RGB gaming PC that's able to crush games over 144 FPS, high settings and 1440p. And the best part is it's gonna cost you less than a thousand dollars. So the total cost of this PC is actually $985 at the time of making this video. And that includes all the extra cosmetic stuff like the cable extensions, extra fans, and even the windows key. You have to pay for it one way or another, so I always like to include it in the parts list when I'm doing these budget builds. Now I did go with Windows 11 this time around to make sure we take advantage of the optimizations, but you can go with Windows 10 Pro if you like and save another $5 because the current price for Windows 10 Pro is around 15 bucks on yourcdkey.com. Just make sure to use the code TS20 to get that 25% off. Now once you pay for it, they will send you the key within minutes and all you have to do is go into the Windows activation settings and put it in. Now if you take away all the cosmetic stuff and the Windows key, then the total cost of this PC is actually $912. But do keep in mind that your system is not going to look anything like this. So if you like the way it looks and you want to build one for yourself, let's go over the parts list and also show you guys what I did to make the PC look like this. You can control your PC from anywhere in the world. With Pulseway's IT monitoring and management platform, you can centralize your systems and stay online even if you're away from the desk. Connect your routers, printers, firewalls, servers, and more. Basically anything with an IP address. You can also check your system's temps, usage, and even end processes right from the app itself. Try Pulseway out for yourself for free by using my link down below. Starting with the CPU, there were really only two options there are really only two options within this budget. We got the Ryzen 5 5600 from the AMD side and then the Core i5-12400F from the Intel side. And while both provide very similar gaming performance while using a mid-range GPU, I simply didn't like going with a dead platform like AM4. There simply just is no upgrade path should you choose to upgrade your system. You would have to buy a completely new CPU, motherboard, and memory if you want to jump ship to DDR5. The 12400F, while it doesn't have any efficient cores like its bigger stepsister, the 12600K, it's still equipped with 6 cores and 12 threads while supporting PCI Gen 5 and DDR5 memory. And we're also able to save money by sticking with the stock cooler, which is more than enough to keep the temps down while gaming. The motherboard of choice is the MSI Pro B660MG, simply because it's only $100 and it supports 12th gen Intel processors right out of the box without having to flash the BIOS. If you have a little bit of money left in your budget and you want a higher quality board, you can go with the B660MA, which has better VRM coverage, more DIMM slots, and onboard USB-C. But honestly, it's not worth the extra $40 and you're not gonna see any additional gaming performance. You should, however, make the choice between the G and the P. Both are $100, but they both have pros and cons. I'll start with the cons. So the G has only two DIMM slots, while the P has four. The G has no USB-C support at all, not in the back and not even on the board itself, while the P not only has front panel USB-C connection, but a rear USB-C port as well. And now for the pros. The G has one extra fan header, while the P does not. The G also has an extra M.2 slot, while the P only has one, and the G has a 5 volt RGB header, while the P only has one 12 volt 4 pin header, which no one really uses anymore. So you gotta weigh your options here. I personally valued the extra M.2 slot and the fan header over the extra two DIMM slots and the uh, USB C connection, because the case I'm using doesn't even have a USB C port in the front, so it didn't really make much sense here. For memory, it's very important to get a pair of sticks that are compatible with your motherboard. That way you can enable the XMP in the BIOS to boost the frequency of your sticks, as well as boost the frame rates in your games. The XPG Z1s from Adata are not only compatible with the board, but they are currently the best priced high speed DDR4 sticks that also matches the white theme I was going for. The rule of thumb when buying memory sticks is that you want to always go with the highest frequency with the lowest seal timing. These are rated at 3200 megahertz with CL16 timing, and they went for only $35. It's crazy how cheap DDR4 memory is right now. By the way, you guys can check on your PC right now if your memory is running at its advertised speed or not. Just go into your task manager, then click on the performance tab up top, and then click on memory. Then you can see the current speed of your memory. If it shows a lower number than what you're supposed to have, then you need to restart your PC, 
go into the BIOS and enable the extreme memory profile. Then you can hit F10 and restart your PC. For memory, we are going with the one terabyte crucial P3 M.2 SSD. This is clearly one of the fastest M.2 drives for less than $50 bringing in up to 5,000 megabytes per second read and write. And since we are using a PCI Gen 4 motherboard, we are able to take advantage of these speeds. Okay, let's talk about the graphics card because here is where you have a lot of options. The GPU prices have dropped significantly over the past few years. And with the failed launch of the RTX 4070, we saw additional price cuts on a lot of the mid-range GPUs. In fact, the RX 6800 dropped in price to $470, making it very attractive within this price point. When we look at a 12 game average 1440p benchmark, we can see that the RX 6800 performs much faster than its direct competitor, the RTX 3070. And it even does slightly better than the RTX 3070 Ti, which costs more than the RX 6800. What's even more embarrassing is that the Gigabyte RX 6800 has double the VRAM of the NVIDIA RTX 3070 Ti, which actually makes a difference in games that require a lot of VRAM. So yeah, the RX 6800 was the perfect choice within this price point. But if you guys want a better GPU than this, and you're okay with going with aftermarket, then I strongly recommend going on eBay and buying a used GPU. The used market right now is freaking incredible for graphics cards, okay? You can get a used RTX 3080 for less than an RX 6800. That's pretty freaking nuts. It's absolutely wild right now in the used market, and it's the perfect time to build a PC. I will admit though, the only good thing the RTX 3070 has going for it is power efficiency. Total power consumption with the RX 6800 is about 424 watts, whereas the 3070 only pulls in 371 watts with all the components. But with that said, a 600 watt power supply is still enough to power the entire system, and it will still have enough headroom for any modest upgrades later down the line. The Apivia Prestige is not only 80 plus gold certified, but it's also semi-modular, meaning I can plug in only the cables I need, aside from the 24 pin and the eight pin EPS. Not to mention, it comes in white, which is perfect for the build. I wasn't even looking for a white power supply, to be honest, it just happened to be in white, which is perfect. But the best part is, it's only $42, you guys. Where else can you find a 600 watt semi-modular 80 plus gold certified power supply for less than 50 bucks? And finally, for the case, I decided to go with the Deepcool CH370. It's such a good looking micro ATX tower with a mesh front panel. We also got a clear side magnetic side panel allowing for easy access inside. And it's even got a built-in headphone anger, which is pretty cool. There's also a built-in GPU sack bracket, which I personally think is a bit pointless for a micro ATX case, right? Like if you're buying a small form factor case, your chances are you're not gonna be going with a bulky card, like an RTX 4080 or even a 4090, but it's still nice that they included one. The only downside with the case is that it comes with only one pre-installed fan, which is simply not enough for cooling, and it's not even in white, which is a bummer. So naturally, I went with a triple fan pack from up here. These have both a three pin fan header cable and a Molex cable. So you can choose how you want to plug them in. If you use the Molex connector, the fans will always run at its max RPM and you can't control the speed. So I decided to use the fan header option so that the fan speeds can be set on a fan curve. Now here's the thing. The motherboard only has three fan headers, one of which has been occupied by the CPU cooler, which means we are two fan headers short to plug in the rest of our fans. We're gonna need a fan splitter. Luckily, there was one on Amazon for only $7. This basically plugs into your CPU fan header on your motherboard and gives you five fan headers to work with. One for the CPU and four for the case fans. Of course, I can't use the ugly stock cables from the power supply on a clean white build, so I picked up a set of white PSU cable extensions from Amazon, but I went with the ABNO1 set because these not only come with a lot of extra white cable combs, but the connectors are also in white, which further contributes to the clean white color scheme. With all these parts, the total came out to $985.93. Now, if you wanna take your PC to the next level, you're gonna have to mod it. Skinning your PC parts is very easy to do, and it's the most cost-effective way of changing the appearance of your build. It's also not permanent and doesn't damage any of your components. So I picked up a sheet of white vinyl from Amazon, I cut it down to a rectangular shape and I skinned the side of the power supply shroud. 
I did this so that there was more white inside the case. But you can do this with any colored vinyl to achieve the desired color scheme that you're going for. I started out from the inside and I used the included spatula to even out the bubbles. Now, if you're comfortable taking the permanent route, you guys can actually paint your parts, which is what I did with most of the components inside here. I painted the CPU cooler, the M.2 SSD shield, the PCI brackets in the back of the case, the included rear fan, and the graphics card. Please note that if you are painting your parts, it will automatically void the warranty and it will be a permanent modification. So exercise extreme caution before you take on such a task. I started by disassembling the parts that I was going to paint, like the CPU cooler, and the graphics card. The GPU took the longest as I had to separate the PCB from the heatsink and the shroud. It's basically like taking it apart and installing a water block. So if you've done a water cooling build before, then this should be a breeze for you. The only parts from the GPU that I'm painting is the shroud with the fans attached and the back plate. Then I proceeded to cover all the areas where I don't want paint to go on. Basically sensitive areas and cables were all covered by blue frog tape. It doesn't have to be pretty, but just make sure you are protecting the sensitive areas that can get damaged from the paint. Before I started spraying, I wiped down all the parts with a microfiber cloth to make sure there isn't any debris or dust stuck on them, as they can create uneven surfaces. The paint I'm using is my trusty Rust-Oleum paint and primer in semi-gloss. And the way I like to paint is by spraying left to right and vice versa from about one feet away. The first coat should be light, covering about 50% of the surface area. The second coat should cover about 75%, and the third coat should be 100%. You can apply a fourth coat if needed for touch-ups or to cover areas that have been missed. Then I waited a full day for the paint to dry before peeling off the frog tape to make sure the paint doesn't accidentally get scraped off during installation. One thing to keep in mind, if you're taking apart your graphics card for any modification you're doing, it's recommended to always apply fresh thermal paste. I use 99% isopropyl and dab a little bit on some paper towel before wiping the paste off the GPU before applying a fresh tube. Also, if any of the thermal pads break off during this process, make sure to replace them. In my case, I had to scrape off the remaining pieces from the VRAM and apply new thermal pads. Afterwards, it was just a matter of reversing the process to assemble the GPU back in one piece. In hindsight, I probably could have done more research and picked a more accurate white vinyl for the power supply shroud, just so it matches the rest of the white in the case, but overall, I'm very satisfied with the results. So yeah, with that said, let's power this bad boy on and check out the gaming benchmarks.
Pretty freaking impressive, I know. It's crazy how far gaming PCs have come, especially when you can push over 144 FPS and 1440p all while spending less than $1,000 and still having a good looking system. In some games, I was actually getting more FPS and 1440p than I was in 1080p, which was interesting. I looked everywhere to find an answer to this strange phenomenon, but I couldn't find one. All I know is that there are people out there who also had the same problem. We know that when you increase the resolution of your game, the GPU takes most of the load off the CPU, but that doesn't explain the increase in FPS. But regardless, I mean, this is still a good problem to have. Some games were even hitting the FPS cap in 1440p like Apex Legends. I was clipping 300 FPS while ADSing on TDM. I mean, granted the map is much smaller than playing the main map, but it's still impressive seeing these numbers. Cyberpunk was also doing surprisingly well, pushing over 100 FPS and 1080p high settings, buttery smooth gameplay, no lag whatsoever. But if you want to really take in the beauty of the game, 1440p is where it's at. And it's still playable too, around 75 FPS is what you'll get in high settings. Hogwarts Legacy didn't do too bad either, pushing consistently over 150 FPS and 1080p and over 100 FPS and 1440. If gaming in 1440p is what your main goal is, then this PC is more than capable of providing that. Okay, let's talk temps real quick. The hottest I've seen the CPU reach was 86 degrees playing Overwatch 2 and 1080p. That game was cooking the CPU. In some instances, we were getting close to 100% utilization. So it's safe to assume there was some bottlenecking present. Bringing up the resolution to 1440p brought down the CPU usage. As the game is now more GPU bound, so we started to see much cooler temps. 
but on average, the CPU was 70 degrees Celsius when we compared it to all the other games tested. The graphics card on the other hand peaked at 71 degrees only in a few games. That was the highest recorded temperature of the RX 6800, while the average was more towards 66 degrees when compared to all the other games tested. Could the temps be a little more cooler had I not paint the parts? Most likely, but it will not make a significant difference. We're talking maybe one or two degrees at most. Regardless of what parts you paint in your own system, great thermal performance comes down to a solid case with great airflow and a really good fan configuration, like the one we have here. We have neutral pressure inside the case with two intake in the front and then two exhaust, one on the top and one in the back. Now, if you made it to the end and you're still watching this video, then chances are you're probably interested in building this exact same PC. Well, lucky for you, I have a full dedicated step-by-step -step build guide on building a PC from start to finish. I'll drop a link to it on the top right. Also down below if you guys wanna check it out. I'll also link all the parts I use for this build down below if you guys wanna check it out. Um, if you're enjoying the PC builds, especially the budget builds, let me know by tossing a like and comment below which budget I should focus on for the next budget PC build. Subscribe for more awesome PC builds coming your way. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys very soon in the next one.